Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Miller Lamb, Executive Director of the AB Corker Foundation for Mental Health. Thank you for joining us. We're glad that you could sit with us for a bit this evening. Now, today's conversation is part of our webinar series where we discuss mental health and overall wellness with professionals from all walks of life. Today's topic is centered on mental health in our judicial and legal systems. This is a very timely talk topic coming uh, at a time when those with mental health concerns are often caught up in those systems, all too frequently with uh, negative and lifelong impacts. Our guests today are passionate advocates for mental health, for the incarcerated and their well being, and for compassion and understanding to be part of the discussion for reform in those systems. Our guest interviewer is Terry McGuire a former crime reporter and the creator and co-host of Giving Voice to Depression, uh, the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, which has been repeatedly voted one of the nation's top depression podcasts. Our guests are Alexandria Hughes and Wesam Shahed. Alexandria Hughes is a University of Michigan graduate and a Michigan native who's passionate about mental health and art. Currently, she works as a mental health and criminal justice organizer at Michigan Liberation. She's part of the leadership team at Accountability for Dearborn. And she has three and a half years of experience working as a behavioral health therapist in schools, homes, and ABA centers at Centria Healthcare. Through work experience and personal experiences with racial inequities, Alexandria has learned that existing problems within our criminal legal system often intersect with problems pertaining to mental health services and access. This motivated her to become an organizer and an advocate for change. Alexandria says, I firmly believe that we can create a world where humanity isn't selective. Next, we have Wissam Shahed. Wissam is a first generation Palestinian American from Chicago, Illinois. He serves as an assistant state's attorney at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, or CCSAO, the second largest prosecutor's office in the United States. Wissam has not only been recognized as one of the most promising young talents in the CCSAO, but he has also been internationally recognized in the Arab American Foundation's 30 Under 30. Wissam recently gave a TEDx talk on criminal justice reform titled, Does Justice Require a Conviction? discussing misconceptions about prosecutors and what alternative prosecution methods need to be focused on. Way Sam's involvement ranges far beyond his day job as he's the finance director for the first Muslim and Palestinian American to be elected by the Democratic Party into Illinois House Legislature in 2023. At only 24, Way Sam earned his BA in pre-law business management from Loyola University, Chicago and his JD from Michigan State University College of Law. Wissam holds executive leadership positions for the Arab American Bar Association, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, and the Arab Professional Business Association. We welcome you, Alexandria and Wissam, and we welcome you, Terry. Thank First you talk. very much. Big Thank topics, you. right? We got social justice, we got mental health, we got incarceration. Any one of those could take an hour. We've got two guests, one hour, and we're gonna just jump right in. So with them, let's start with you and tell me what how you consider the current situation. How do you see, I don't wanna describe it as a problem unless you are going to, but what is the current situation related to mental health and primarily for people who are incarcerated? Well, with regards to the criminal justice system, and actually, let's pause. Mm -hmm. just want to say, first of all, Terry, thank you so much for having me and Stephanie, Zaina, and everyone on the Core Core Foundation. Uh, I'm really excited for this webinar. And in regards to the criminal justice system, the, uh, prosecutors' offices across the nation are beginning and have already started in most parts of the nation to start really focusing on mental health as a means to help rehabilitate defendants, whether they're incarcerated or preventing them from becoming incarcerated in the first place. And our judicial system at the same time, judges across the nation are really seeing this as an issue and tackling it head on. 
there's programs that are being created nationwide and including in my office to help divert defendants instead of criminally prosecuting them and having them get a conviction on their record that there are programs such as something called deferred prosecution where if they get the treatment they need they're able to be prevented from getting any type of conviction on their record and at the same time we send back someone who has the tools and resources to succeed back in our society so overall there is this trend that's increasing across our nation where most i would say if not all judicial systems in the united states are now behind this movement and seeing the value and starting to see it actually working now whether or not there are all the resources that can be that are available made available to these types of programs that's a different question that we can definitely explore throughout this webinar but uh, it's definitely improving, thankfully. Alexandra, in Detroit, in your work, are you seeing an improvement in the situation? Uh, I'm seeing a few things. I would say I hope to see uh, improvement uh, in the situation, uh, especially within communities uh, that are primarily Black and Latinx and uh, more likely to be impacted. I am seeing a, uh, I'm seeing more awareness uh, and, and knowing about mental health, appreciating it and, and understanding it is something we need, but I'm not seeing enough of the funding being put into the programs. I'll, I'll say uh, a, a lot of suburban communities such as Ann Arbor uh, have invested in mental health services that are non-carceral and in Detroit that is being talked about. And um, I would like to see that uh, you know come to fruition. Uh, uh, turn into something real um, because there is a lot of people who the first time they had access to mental health resources was after they were incarcerated and I don't want to see that uh, continuing to happen. It is one of those facts that I think is astonishing each time I read it that the main provider of mental health services in our country is jails and prisons. And every time I hear that, I'm just like, wait, what? Because then I also hear the care isn't very good. The care is, is inadequate. We said, what do you think about the changes within the prisoners? Part of the goal to keep people out of them and maybe have a CIT, a crisis intervention team respond early on instead of the police, which might lead to a trial and incarceration. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with Alexandria's points earlier, and I alluded to it in my first answer, that these types of programs that are existing right now inside the criminal justice system are heavily, you know, understaffed, very underpaid, and not enough manpower behind this, right? We need more employees overall. Now, in, in regards to, you know, preventative measures, I, I mean, me personally, I, I definitely think that there should be individuals, a part of these teams who are trained in mental health uh, capabilities. Uh, we shouldn't just be leaning just on our law enforcement who may not have the training or if they do, you know, they're not expertise on these types of issues. But having individuals like this in the long run definitely could be helpful in preventing these issues. And, you know, Terry, you brought up that uh, statistic earlier that you were talking about that, you know, it's the number one provider are these jails. When you brought up the irony is, is that back to Alexandria's point, there's just not enough resources there, right? These individuals who are incarcerated are probably among the uh, populations in our country who need it the most, right? And you know, this is a big call to action that we need to talk to our local state legislatures, you know, the legislative uh, representatives and our federal ones, right, to provide more funding inside these types of programs. And not even just on a state or national level, but even more locally on the county level as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Alexandra, with, with the population in prisons and jails disproportionately, you know, that they're very overrepresented people with mental health issues, is that, I always think chicken or egg, right? Is it that the people with mental health issues are more likely to be incarcerated or is it the experience of being incarcerated that really exacerbates or brings on mental health issues? Uh, yeah, definitely chicken or the egg. Uh, this conversation has gone back and forth. <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, the 
uh, being incarcerated uh, exacerbates and, and, and makes uh, anyone who has mental health um, needs or disabilities, it makes it more intense and it, and it makes it harder for them to function uh, in life uh, with those post-incarceration. Uh, I'll say that, uh, uh, you know, it can contribute to the stigma um, labeling uh, those with mental health needs as violence does contribute to the stigma. And, um, it, it, and I feel is why a lot of people don't speak up about it soon enough because being labeled as something's wrong with you, um, being othered is, is uh, what that is called and has been labeled that historically. Um, and, and I think the sooner we can, we can uh, find out about if someone has mental health needs, the better we can prevent a lot of headaches. The care within those systems, we, we always talk about funding, but is there even a, an attempt to provide quality mental health care to the people who are incarcerated? Or is it, I don't, or is it something else, the, the priority? There are attempts, uh, yeah, that do exist, have existed. It's, it's more of, from what I've read and, and know based off of family members and what they've said, it's the same thing, um, doing the same things over and over again. Uh, I was reading something uh, where a few years ago uh, in Michigan, they had um, like a mental health, um, what is it, like a mental health council in, in their prison mm -hmm. and mental health services, like a separate division for it. And I think to myself, isn't it just a why not, why not just give them mental health care instead of adding to the prisons mm -hmm. uh, if something is not working? Um, yeah. So Sam, let's talk about some of the programs that are working, including yours in Cook County. Uh, the diversion program, as you said, has results that cannot be ignored. Hmm. Yeah, so at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, I, you know, I, I'm honored to be one of those public servants that um, is just even a part of the the administration that has such progressive and positive values that really takes these diversion programs seriously, which includes mental health, but also includes uh, diversion courts, including prostitution court, drug, alcohol, veterans court, and so many of these other types of specialty courts that help these individuals. So for instance, maybe let's say the drug or alcohol specialty court, someone who's dealing with drug abuse, right? And the instinct years upon years ago was to lock them up mm -hmm. and then get them no help. So they come back out, they still have this drug issue or alcohol issue, right? And all you've done is exasperate it because now you've set this individual back potentially that they've lost their job. So things just get worse, right? Now, within the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, uh, we have a statistic since 2012 through 2022 within this 10 year uh, period, our office has worked with the judicial system at Cook County, it being the second largest county in the nation, and nearly out of 20,000 cases that have gone through this diversion program, um, about 75% of the individuals that have gone through have graduated successfully from this program. And of these 75% of graduates, nearly 80% of them, nearly 80% of them, have not been rearrested once. So it's really, you know, it's, 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 it shows this works, right? Getting people treated in the right way with the right individuals in place is proof of product, right? This works. Now, just imagine if we were able to invest heavily inside of these programs with the billions upon billions of dollars that the United States government uses a nationwide per incarceration systems, even just take one of those billion of dollars, just one billion dollars, right? And I'm saying just one billion dollars as right. if it's but imagine, imagine if you just took that and heavily reinvested in these two programs that we know work. Imagine how many lives you could change for the better. Imagine that. This would be astronomical, right? And the, the judicial system, this isn't some foreign concept that no one's ever spoke of, and it just came about within the past five years or something. This has been here, you know? Uh, I mean, in our office, it's it's been there at least in the 90s, right? So, I mean, there's a 30-year-plus old programs that have existed. 
So getting getting on board as quickly as possible, getting this funding and these resources, or the resources at work is essential because we could be saving so many lives and not just saving. I want to pretend like, oh my God, we're saving all these people. So no, helping. And also giving these individuals the tools and resources to succeed once they enter uh, back outside of the incarceration system. And, and I just want to add to that too, and even more on a more local level, uh, like in Detroit, for example, uh, uh, Detroit police officers receive 60 uh, plus mental health calls per day. Um, the 60 calls are the, the minimum amount that they receive. There are uh, evidence-based solutions out there in other cities that are working like the STAR mental health program, like CAHOOTS mental health program, also others that exist in California on a more local level. And, uh, and it's drastically uh, decreasing uh, the numbers that they're seeing with theft, the numbers they're seeing uh, related to domestic violence and other various crimes. And uh, the CAHOOTS program, for example, has been around since I believe the um, the eighties, and it's only approved since existing, and it is a complete independent team of uh, mental health professionals uh, that is that operate mobile, uh, and and that is something I would like to see in Detroit in every community. And on uh, a note on the funding, um, also seeing our governments do participatory budgeting more, where community members have input on where funding funding does go. And I believe that could stop a lot of uh, problems before they start. And uh, in places like Denver and Aurora, Colorado, we are seeing that. Alexandria, uh, it's Stephanie. I'm, I'm curious to know, um, so the CAHOOTS program and the STAR program, how does the average person not call the police when they need something, but get the CAHOOTS team or the STAR team? How does that work? Well, they can call the 988 number. Uh, is the 988 number is supposed to connect you to the most the services that are closest to you. So for uh, Aurora, Colorado, for example, or, or Denver, it would reroute them to, uh, to uh, the STAR program. And uh, with CAHOOTS, although both of them do have their own independent phone numbers and everything too, so the uh, CAHOOTS and the STAR program work together with uh, the mayor and the council to make sure that when 911 is called pertaining to these matters that are mental health related, they are routed to STAR right. uh, mental health program officials or uh, CAHOOTS uh, that in our, out of Oregon. So that is one way. Of, I know some uh, have it completely separate. Uh, but I, I think it's most important to, to look at uh, these models and look at the results first uh, and then um, tracing back um, to see how that started. We're, we are all in the habit of 911, um, which doesn't necessarily help people who are um, in a non-suicidal situation, but are in a mental health crisis. Um, so 988, that's very good to know. Thank you, Alexandria. I didn't realize that could actually get you other services. That's great. So if there are evidence-based programs on the community level and within the judicial system that are working and have statistics and are proven, why are they not being widely adapted and adopted across the country? I guess uh, I could give multiple answers to that. Yes. Uh, one, <laughs> I, I'll say first, uh, you know, it could be as simple as adding a uh, ballot initiative or doing a ballot initiative and get it, getting it added on ballot. So I know in Chicago, I, uh, they recently did this where uh, they, uh, on the ballot, they asked for a public health um, department uh, to service those mental health needs um, and uh, to be ran independently with like a coalition of folks. So peer support, ABA, uh, social workers, et cetera, uh, working together. Um, so that was something that happened and did get passed. And, and any, anyone can uh, petition to have something put on the ballot. And that is something we all can do. I'll also say it also depends whether or not we are uh, meeting with our elected officials. Are we making calls? Are we talking to them? Are we, you know, and, and, and it's as simple as going to a city meeting or sending emails. There's even apps a lot of cities have now to make it easier to communicate. Other reasons why this hasn't been heavily invested in, uh, 
partly is related to the government and our school boards. I know in Michigan, uh, I recently saw uh, our government um, is investing more heavily into school resource officers uh, versus uh, mental health uh, professionals, peer support specialists in schools. And that is an issue area. Um, I'll also say too, on the note of our school board, it also just depends on the funding and um, what funding is available, what is prioritized. I know oftentimes, I know I do sometimes forget, okay, the school board is an actual election as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, you know, municipal. Uh, but that is one way we could start to see more of this happen by being more involved in those rooms, having our opinions at the table, making sure participatory budgeting is the uh, is like the priority um, over uh, our governments deciding for us. Or Sam? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say you need advocates in the room who are creating the budgets, right? If mm -hmm. and this is just anything in life, right? If they're not in the room advocating, we need to make room on this budget for this issue. Like you know, Alexandra was kind of talking about putting things on the ballot. Why does it matter? Right? We can talk about the statistics and approve all day long, but if you don't have someone sitting at that table where the budget's being made and having that voice saying, we need this allocation. The example Alexandria gave about the school resource officer versus having a mental health uh, professional be there instead. There's obviously individuals in the room saying safety is a priority, right? We need to have more resource officers to protect our students. So the reverse needs to happen, right? Having individuals in that room saying, well, actually, how do we prevent this from happening? Let's get more mental health individuals in there. Um, you know, and we're talking about on the school, and I, by all means, that's not on my expertise, but bringing this back into the judicial system and where we're looking at the lens of this, right? This, this is bigger than maybe just the prosecutor's office, the judges, the public defender's office, right? This becomes a countywide, right, budget. That's what it ends up becoming, which is, you know, millions of people, you know, at least in uh, Detroit County, and Alexandra, correct me if I'm wrong, that's Wayne County, right? Wayne County? Yes. Yeah, so like yes. Wayne County, imagine their budget. Imagine Cook County's budget when you have one of the largest cities in the nation, right? The politics that get into that, and Alexandria was talking about putting things on the ballot. Um, you know, that's definitely the beginning of it, but all these politicians have to have buy-in in this, right? And that's where, you know, individuals like who work in the Kirkland Foundation, AB Kirkland Foundation, and other advocacy groups coming up to these politicians and engaging them is so critical. I'll also say to it, and, and it, this is genuinely something everyone should care about because it impacts yeah. all of us. You, you look at the numbers the CDC put forward uh, and it says that 50% of uh, Americans will be, uh, will be diagnosed with a mental illness at some point with their life or have mental health needs. Mm -hmm. And seeing those numbers, um, seeing how, how often those who are disabled are victims of uh, the, the uh, carceral system. Uh, versus receiving the care uh, that they deserve. And, and also seeing the gaps between uh, what, is, what is told to us, um, what we, which is safety versus what we feel is safe. Uh, and, and I think these are the things we need to interrogate and, and in our own circles as well. And, and some of the things we can do is take mental health first aid trainings and uh, you know courses that you can take uh, what through National Council of Mental Health, um, there's also some resources where you could take it for free. And I, I think part of finding the solution is holding ourselves accountable um, to changing ourselves and, and the community we live in. And I just wanted to add on to Alexandra's point that that's such an interesting statistic that 50% of people will have interacted with this. And Stephanie mentioned earlier that insane call 911 right? Because that will mm -hmm. cure everything. Everyone just call 911. It doesn't matter what it is. Just call it, right? And uh, specifically right now, I'm uh, specializing in domestic violence prosecution right now. That's where I'm at in my unit. And a lot of the victims that I talk to, right, talk about exactly what Alexandra was talking about, that, that statistic, the 50%, that they actually just want their significant other to get mental health treatment, anger management, or whatever it may be, right? When there's the issues happening within the household, Right, and they don't know where to go. So guess what they do? They do exactly what Stephanie says. Just mm -hmm. tell them I don't know what else to do. 
right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then that's when law enforcement arrives and that whole interaction and the domino effect begins, right? And that's just one example. I'm not saying all domestic violence victims right, okay. want this, right? There's other okay. scenarios, but this is definitely a tie-in to what Stephanie and Alexandria were talking about. You know, this large number of people that face this day in, day out. And the two things are coming to mind. One, the why people should care when someone is released from the criminal justice system, they're released into our society. And, and so if you don't care because it's another human being who deserves to be cared for and, and to become healthier, they're going to be, you know, in, in our world and the healthier the people in our community, the healthier our community. But there's also the matter of recidivism. And one of the, the shocking statistics I read today was that recidivism it's always been a hard word for me. Recidivism rates are 50 to 230% higher for persons with mental health disorders. Oh, and that, right? And that having that criminal record yes. can influence subsequent police interactions. And you're talking about calling 911 because once you get that call, you see this person and you go, oh, he's got a record. She's got a record. They've got a record. You may choose the criminal justice system over the mental health system in dealing with that person. And as you know way better than I do, Sam, the criminal record can also weigh very negatively in court. So it, it really, once it starts, it's that snowball where you didn't get the help you needed, maybe, you know, maybe even it wasn't a criminal activity that you were involved in. And then you, you get in, you get out, you go back. It's, it's really quite a entrenched mm. issue and problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I've spoken with officers in the past about, let's say there's a type of charge, criminal trespass land, where someone who's homeless is literally breaking into a place just to spend the night, yeah. right? So they get they get a phone call from the landlord, right? Whoever it is, the warehouse landlord, or whoever it is, the police find out, okay, and what do they do? They don't, you know, of course, some officers, if we have the means, homeless shelter, others, you're coming in for to that night, right? Mm -hmm. So then ter what Terry talks about kicks in. Say there's a conviction that happens. We talk about that snowball, that domino effect. Now this person gets a conviction, right? Where, I mean, and we, we talk about homelessness, but sometimes it, it's in, uh, sometimes it's heavily connected with that mental health issue. Well, why, why are they homeless? Why, you know? And now this domino effect begins where this individual now has a conviction on the record, or as Terry said, multiple convictions. And every time, how, do, how does this person escape? Right when they're applying for a job, there's that famous checkbox. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Checkbox, yes or no. On every single type, you can apply for fast food, retail, to professional jobs. It doesn't matter. It's there. Then you have loans, right? You want to do student loans, business loans. You want to open up your own business. Guess what? The banks are asking. Guess what? The governments are asking. Everyone's asking this. When you apply just to get an apartment, right? Just to get housing, not even buying, not even buying, just to rent something. That question appears. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we set up these people that Terry are talking about when they are released from incarceration, the tools for success here, mm -hmm. right? And by all means, no one is saying, hey, oh my God, inside this prison system, we're going to cure you. You're going to walk out and you're going to be this, you know, that, that's the hope by all means. That's, that's really the hope. But at least giving them the tools and resources to succeed. The individuals, you know, the counselors on hand, um, and it, it, it's not even just after their, their release, right? Getting in there before they get into the system is extremely crucial. That's why when we talk about these deferred prosecution programs, these specialty courts, how important they are that they go through these graduation programs and these graduation steps Right, to prevent them from even getting to that point of almost no return once that conviction kicks in and now their life just you know could potentially spiral from there what, what i do appreciate is uh the areas like in michigan uh oakland county the oakland county prosecutor they have a mental health court mm -hmm. and that is for uh an adult one but also a youth one that they recently created and they also have a mental health liaison as well so instead of you know uh, you being charged with a crime conviction uh, we're directing you to mental health services instead and uh, and accumulating data on demographics and and how people get there to find out how we can prevent this from even happening in the first place uh, that is the change i'm looking forward to to seeing how it grows because yes. we can 
you know, prevent this from uh, exacerbating and, and getting worse. Uh, another statistic, this is from NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And, and Alexandria, you brought up the, the concept of the criminalization of mental illness when we spoke before tonight. And they estimate that between 25 and 40 percent of Americans with mental illnesses will be jailed or incarcerated at some point in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that is a shocking number when, as you said, with some the number, you know, people who will be diagnosed with a mental or not diagnosed, but will, you know, later be believed to have mental illness. So it is just a, it, 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 it starts and then it doesn't seem to stop. It's, you are both doing things out in the community to, to make a difference, but I can see how it could just be like, I, well, I don't know what to do. So, so how do we focus the community and say, this is a problem. The solution does in fact impact your life and your family and we need to, to care. Mm -hmm. I say it first starts with, awareness and education and making sure the community knows that mental health is just as important as physical health. Physical health is put on this pedestal a lot of times when I talk to community members and, and mental health isn't so much, but actually a lot of uh, mental health needs we have actually increase. Like we need more needs, mental health needs and disorders can develop if uh, we aren't tending to them and have physical disabilities. So both do matter. And, and, and it, it starts first with, with making sure that is known in every environment, whether work environment, whether schools, uh, and, and us, us uh, making sure we, we put that first. I say it also starts with uh, us joining other community members who are also already doing this work. So uh, local organizations uh, and whether it's, it's uh, these mobile mental health response programs that already exist, making sure uh, that they have the support, learning from them and or uh, donating or uh, sitting in on meetings and just volunteering um, is also an option. I'll say to uh, uh, seeing this as urgent and, and, and this is a crisis, it is. There, it is a mental health crisis. Uh, and it should be treated as such. For example, uh, you know, there is in Detroit, uh, the city has waited, pushed back so many different things involving mental health. And I operate as if more people and they will, more people will die and will be harmed if nothing happens and their lives matter. And I'm seeing a lot of people be treated um, in an inhumane way. Porter Burks, for example, uh, was a, a case where he was black male schizophrenic um, and he was shot at multiple times, uh, over 15 times by law enforcement, he died. I remember the family members saying they wish they, they would have never called the police in the first place. Sure. They didn't know what to do though. They just didn't know what to do. Yeah. And, I, and that saddens me. Uh, a couple weeks later, Kiaza Miller dies as well, also schizophrenic and a black woman. And I don't want us to keep reliving the same thing because we don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, for all of us, I feel to bring awareness to the community, for community to see it as urgent because it is. And when we, when we participate in creating positive change, we also help ourselves because we're reinforcing that mental health matters just as much as physical. Why do you think it's not perceived as urgent? Because it seems a lot more things would be happening and happening more consistently and more quickly if it was. I think it's because of the stigma and uh, the stigma and the lack of access and, and in some instances, it may be um, tied to, uh, to our culture too, uh, and to trauma. Uh, and I'm just thinking of, in terms of racial trauma and, and thinking about uh, the journey I've seen my family go through mental health, being, being open to therapy uh, now. But I remember talking to my little sister who was younger than me. She was what, 18 at the time and said, this isn't mental, health services is not for us, meaning not for black people, because that's all she saw who got mental health care were people that did not look like her. Mm -hmm. 
and I think part of it is is those barriers that exist um, on a racial and ethnic level. Uh, and, and the other part of not seeing urgent is the stigma, the fear of of being separated from society, othered, uh, and, and and you know not receiving help. And and that that's something that has happened systemically, historically. It, it even dates back to this, our census. They label people with mental disabilities separate in the census and asked people if they were had people who were feeble-minded in their home. And, and that is why a lot of people do not come out and, and speak up about mental health and see it as urgent as uh, physical health. Sam, do you notice a sense of urgency within the criminal justice system? And, and I assume you speak outside of just uh, the Chicago or Cook County area. Do you, do you get a good reception? People saying this has to change, you know, this has gone on for too long, or is it sort of like, yeah, well, they're in prison, you know? I mean, there are, there's that too. That's another stigma and another discrimination. I would say at least in Cook County, there definitely is this push. Um, um, I, I would say no one's like forgetting about it completely. Um, is it like the number one priority? No, it's not like the number one priority, but I definitely think that people, it's on people's minds. You know, the judges that I'm in front of, right, they do, for the most part, genuinely care when these issues are brought up and they are checking in with the defendants, making sure that, you know, if they are part of these programs, that they are completing it step by step by step. Um, at least the public defender's office, what I've had contact with, that they're invested as well. On the our offices end, they definitely care. Now, as in terms of you know outside the uh, the county, I have seen it that there is this movement slowly but surely. Um, and like I said, it's been happening for years um, that people are getting on board with this idea that mental health is important. And, you know, Terry, I wanted to circle back to what you and Alexandria were just talking about, make a quick comment about, you know, this, this idea about the segmentation and why, why you know, what, what steps we can take, uh, essentially, and Alexandria was talking about, you know, being the education components, and it's definitely multifaceted, you know, the education is so crucial, right, our, our, there's a lot of people who are perhaps nervous, and then perhaps unaware, and or just in general, not, not well educated or inverse in this world. And I definitely agree with Alexandria about cultural stigmatization. I can speak as an Arab American, I see Zena on the call, she could probably uh, agree with this, that the Arab culture, you know, mental health therapy, that is not a thing, you know, you know, there's no such thing as that. Like if you're having a bad day, anxiety, whatever it is. So there's definitely that cultural component but when we take it into the macro, you know, how, how do we prevent these individuals uh, from coming in? Education is definitely the first step. I, I totally agree with Alexandria. But what comes in next? Okay, well, once we get these people aware and an incident occurs, how do we have people not have the Stephanie instinctive that she was talking about of calling 911 immediately when something's going on? How do we prevent that? Well, that's education is number one. But, you know, Terry, it goes back to your question. Once law enforcement does arrive, what happens in that moment? right? What's that, that crucial moment that can now start that domino effect? You know, Alexandria was talking about that incident where that family said, well, I wish we didn't call the police, right? right? Because look what happened, right? How do we prevent that from ever happening? Well, Terry goes back to the question that you were talking about earlier. Do we get mental health professionals as a part of this, right? On board with these types of incidents and have these individuals on staff, whether they're a part of law enforcement departments or their, their own entities, different question, different time. But yeah, getting those individuals um, on board and in the court systems, we see, okay, if they end up somehow in the court system, we know now, we're, I mean, we've been knowing, but um, you know, with that statistic, that these specialty courts work, investing more. Alexandria and I have talked about it, whether it's being on the ballot, you have to engage your local politicians. You have to make them care. You have to show them that this is a priority, that people's lives, people you know, people you personally know have been affected by this. People in your community have been personally affected by this. How about we stop having these incidents that Alexandria talked about? You know, you tell these politicians these incidents that occur, and let's stop this from happening. And they can't, right, if they choose to do so by investing more resources into programs, these preventative programs. And we don't, it, the hope would be 
You don't even have to worry about these people, or I don't want to say these people, individuals getting inside these incarceration systems in the first place and setting them up for bail possibly in the future. Mm -hmm. I'll also say uh, more violence prevention and uh, also conflict resolution uh, programs. I, I know some of these exist uh, in California uh, and, uh, and that's also another thing being explored um, in Detroit um, by city council and because of some of the decreases in violence that has been seen by these other groups doing it. And a lot of the time, um, when you, when you look at what people are incarcerated for in the US, for example, and, and looking at how much uh, is nonviolent crimes, and, and that is a way to see how we can, we can create better options for people. And, uh, you know, so I often think like, well, how did that individual end up doing that action? Like, did they, what came before that? And I don't think that's something we ask enough. I, I think, uh, when elected officials do that, and, and we do that in our communities, uh, before calling 911, uh, that could stop a lot as well. Asking individuals what they need, who are, uh, uh, you know, in need and distress, um, asking them what is what do you need, what is safe for you. It could be something in that environment, something that uh, is causing them stress, uh, um, and I think we have to model that. Yeah, and you know, I, I totally agree with Alexandra. I always tell people, you know, when they ask why did I become a prosecutor, and uh, or you know, even above that, I, I tell people I didn't become a prosecutor to lock up someone who's stealing a candy bar from Walmart, stealing food, right? That's not why. I, I, you see, and Alexandra is laughing, like really, like is that is that what we want out of this world? The individual who is stealing food to survive, possibly. And I, I know I'm using a candy bar as an example, but individuals. You know these nonviolent offenses, right? Yeah. Where we need to be focusing more on homeless shelters, mental health programs, drug and alcohol uh, programs, anger management. Provide mentorship to these individuals to talk about the question that Alexandria was saying: the why. Why is this person here in the first place? Why are they doing this this action that they have been accused of doing, possibly, right? And get to the root of that. And prevent that from happening in the first place or tackling that issue head on, you know, our criminal justice system would just evolve into something truly something, all right? And, you know, I, I, the resources that get allocated to holding individuals inside these incarceration systems, just imagine if we were able to take a small chunk of that and just push it into these types of programs, what type of change we would see? Well, I have a quick question for you on that. I I, I wonder if the proliferation of private um, uh, penitentiaries, private um, incarcerated incarceration facilities, has that helped as we look at the incarcerated population actually receiving treatment? Or has that all come down to the bottom line in money? And we're actually offering less when we have privatized um, incarceration facilities rather than um, subsidized, state subsidized. And Stephanie, who's that being asked to? I just want to make sure. Oh, um, anyone who'd like to answer. Okay. <laughs> I can add on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say I don't think it helped. Uh, and I say that because I'm, I know that a lot of private institutions are incentivized uh, for maintaining their population. Mm -hmm. And a lot of corporations also work with them to make sure that's maintained. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times uh, there, there's many links between, um, you know, where, and it's kind of off topic, but I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of people who are undocumented. I, I am thinking of that and those facilities that house those individuals and those being owned by the same people. Uh, and, and, and that's why, that, why I say I don't think it's helping um, and, and the numbers of who's incarcerated, how many people, the, the demographic that is still overly incarcerated, uh, it, it hasn't contributed to decreasing that barrier. Mm. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I would agree that I, I don't think it helps 
whatsoever that that perhaps incentivization exists. Um, but you know, at the same time, I was talking with Terry about this on the phone just a couple of days ago. We see inside these incarceration. I, I wish I had a statistic on, and I can follow up with it. That when an individual who has a mental health issue comes inside these incarceration systems, right, and it can be just the smallest issue at the time, mental health, uh, whatever diagnosis it could be, it can be so acute that it gets exasperated yes, by this yes. insane amount just being held in these systems, right? And that th we need to be able to prevent that from happening because it, it happens all the time, right? These individuals come out with something that was supposed to be so acute at the time, it comes out to being, you know, bigger and better for the worse for everyone, uh, you know? And that that's why it's so necessary, whether it's private or public in these prison systems, getting those individuals who are trained on the ground to prevent this issue from getting greater than it is. Yeah. I will also say too, I, I think um, another reason why education is so important in, in this matter, uh, because when we have the education, we start to see, uh, we start to understand how the links exist between um, mental health and incarceration and how that is combined. I'm just thinking about things like uh, uh, involuntary commitment uh, and then also um, it, just looking at um, uh, uh, incarceration institutions and how some people, you know, they're put into solitary confinement uh, and, and thinking about how uh, when you look at the meaning behind um, straight jackets, which were heavily used, uh, mm -hmm years ago, you know, and the spelling of, of straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, means confinement, means to be uh, enclosed, to be uh, uh, in solitude. That is the definition of that. And when we look at uh, uh, mental health wards and how people were put in those con conditions where they were confined in solitary and 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 looking at incarceration and how solitary confinement exists and how you you trace that all the way back to the uh, inception of our country. And you look at something that used to exist called the box. And that existed uh, uh, where those who, who were enslaved were put there, they tried to escape. That has transformed, that has reformed into something called the whole, which is slang. Or solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, and I say that to say this is why it's important to know the history behind uh, what we're seeing today, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can truly determine uh, whether it's humane or not. Humane, indeed. Uh, one of an article that Stephanie sent me from Cornell. I'm going to grab your your research here. Um, uh, to that point about solitary confinement, it says an estimated 100,000 prisoners in the U.S. are being held in solitary confinement at any given time and that inmates diagnosed with mental illness are disproportionately represented in those isolation units. Um, obviously, punitive segregation has serious short-term and long-term repercussions on mental health, and that symptoms can include, no surprise here, anxiety, depression, anger, cognitive disturbances, perceptual distortions, obsessive thoughts, psychosis, often tending toward further infraction of rules. So there's that cycle and that snowball of cycle. dominoes, yeah, that we kept talking about. And to your point, Sam, um, the I looked this up after we talked. Um, prison conditions such as crowded living quarters, lack of privacy, increased risk of victimization, exposure to punitive segregation, mm -hmm. are all strongly correlated with emerging and worsening psychiatric systems, including not psychiatric systems, psychiatric symptoms, including self harm, and. Mm -hmm. Disorders likely to deteriorate during incarceration include, again, major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and psychosis. So if you don't go in with a mental health condition, you know, you may very well develop one during your incarceration. And, and just imagine, you know, the, the, the whole that Alexandra yeah, talks about, right. pretend you put someone who is depressed well, inside the hole, right? right? What, what do you think is going to happen? Honestly, Absolutely. Guys, anyone Absolutely. here, like, I, what, what do you think is going to happen? Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's why suicide rates go up. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I didn't mean to chuckle while I said that, I assure you. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's 
how could it not? How could it not? Where, where what, what distraction from your thoughts do you have? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. So in our final minutes, I'd like to just ask you both when you were asked to speak on the critical topics, you know, of mental health and incarceration and social justice, if there was a message you were hoping that listeners and anybody still listening, it means they're actually interested and perhaps motivated to be part of this much needed change. So I'd, I'd ask you both for closing comments. Uh, I'll let Alexandra go first, ladies first. No. Yes, uh, it's all in with two things. And uh, I'll first just say, uh, you know, um, carceral systems are designed uh, for punishment mm -hmm. and mental health care, mental health services is supposed to be for healing uh, and restoration. And if we want to see that in our communities, we have to we have to take action on that. Not only, not only to uh, our friends, but also to our family, also in our workspaces, making sure that's always on the table in every discussion. I'll also say one way individuals can get involved is by uh, learning from other organizations and, and being in community with them. And uh, some of those, uh, Michigan Liberation, uh, miliberation.org. Uh, we have a care not criminalization campaign where all of these items are being discussed and policy is pre being presented. And, and we are working with uh, groups and individuals statewide to make sure this there's not only liberation for Michigan, but also for all of our states and cities. I, I, I also recommend uh, looking into the CAHOOTS uh, mental health program and the STAR mental health program to see how these templates can also be applied in your communities. We will link to all three of those things, Alexandria. So with some. Yeah, I would Sam. say two points is one on the professional and, and one on the personal. Uh, starting with the professional, I, I, I would be asking anyone who's watching this, uh, you know, family, friends, colleagues, associates, that you, you have to get involved with your, your your local politicians. I don't know how many times that has been said today, but it needs to be stressed that working with coalitions, right, other organizations and other minority groups and other advocacy groups is a must, right, to get resources. Today's topic in our webinar was about the criminal justice system overall and mental health in relation to it, right? there is changes and improvements that still need to be made. I'm on the ground every single day. Alexandria is there as well. And we can tell you firsthand, it's still not enough. There's still more work to do. And we need your help to do it, honestly, that we need you to get with your local politicians on the local, the county, the state, the federal level, all of them, and go in there into their offices with their staffers and I, I'll tell you, you know, uh, Terry brought this up in my bio. I'm, I'm currently working with a state representative on a local level right now. And I've seen, I've seen it through his lens, uh, the, the power, you know, that these representatives and the bills and working together, what types of laws can be passed and done the right way. And actually, it's not just with this one representative. It's all these advocacy groups coming in and pushing him, right, and pushing representatives like this and the experts coming to testify at these committee hearings, right? You know, such as Alexandria, right? Who would come in and testify on these expertise of why these issues matter. We have to push these local politicians so they can pass it into law, have these resources afforded into offices like my, uh, my, my office, you know, and where it makes it easy and convenient for prosecutors, right, across the nation to want to do this, right? And judges and public defenders and everyone to be on board, not saying that they're not, but make it so much easier, more affordable, and not just for these three entities, but for the people who are heavily understaffed, heavily overworked and heavily underpaid, right? That are doing the real work on the ground in the judicial system. And I'll end with this in a personal note, we've touched on it. You know, where does this begin, right? To get this allyship. It actually ironically starts at your own dinner table with your own families. And I would ask 
anyone who's listening to this, you know, Alexandria touched on this, is the, to end the stigmatization, right? You know, we talk about, it, it, it's prevalent definitely in the minority communities, you know, Alexandria and I have talked about this, but even in non-minority communities, that mental health is this horrible thing to be talked about. That if you do have a mental illness, that means you're weak, right? That means you're not capable. And that's not true at all. You know, everyone in this Zoom lobby and anyone who's listening for sure knows one person who's struggling with mental health. And sometimes, and they're the strongest people you could ever meet, right? And to end this segmentation is key because once you do that, right, that's when you can truly build this allyship, right? And bring it to these individuals who can make these differences. So I would end with those two notes. And you know, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, Terry, Alexandria, Wissam, and Zena, our Director of Community Outreach and Marketing, thank you so much for your time today and for this excellent discussion. Um, for those watching, thank you for your time and your interest. Um, this episode has been brought to you by the AB Corcor Foundation for Mental Health. Um, our foundation serves to make the world a better place for those who are facing or impacted by ill mental health. And we do that by raising awareness, enforcing the role of physical activity in mental health and overall wellness, and in breaking stigma. As a nonprofit, we can't do it without you. So we thank you for your support and for checking out our webinars. Um, please consider sharing this link with your family and friends. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, you can find additional information and additional conversations at our website, abkf.org. Uh, you'll also find links to information about our guests uh, and to uh, Wissam's TED Talk, TEDx Talk, and other uh, mental health resources. We do welcome your feedback if you have a story to share or a mental health related topic that you would like to discuss. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at abkf.org. So thank you again, all of you. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Nick's back. Yeah, Nick's nice. back. Amazing, amazing. It was really good, guys. Yes. You guys answered all my questions. I had a list and I'm like, okay. <laughs> they answered <laughs> that. Awesome. They answered that. I was like, wow, they're just, it, it was wonderful. I mean, I learned so much myself. So I learned. Oh my really gosh. Great. Was, yes, we could like information. talk oh, for you, hours. You oh I God. know I was going to say, I'm like, <laughs> so how do I get into the local politician office? Like, what well, do I have to do? I'll tell Alexander, you what, are you, you going to just, me? you call yeah. and you make an appointment. You call yeah. and you make an appointment. And you when know. your representatives from Congress are back home, their job is to meet with you and to meet with your representatives. Okay. And they do actually take it seriously. Uh, when I was working in the arts, I was constantly at the Capitol talking to my representatives about the importance um, mm -hmm. of the arts for whatever. But it's, yeah. it is easy to go talk to your representatives yeah. and make okay. an appointment. Stephanie, Stephanie is beyond right. Like in these offices, I, it, it doesn't matter if it's Congress to state representatives to the local mayor, like at least in the state legislature and the uh, Congre congressional level, they literally have a department called constituent services, literally mm -hmm. people pinpointed on these issues where you can raise these issues to them and then they bring it back to the representative. And in, especially like what Stephanie said, um, let's use uh, Congress when they come back, but even on the state level, they always have an in-district office that literally you can call up at any time and, you know, and you can actually walk in too and say, I'd like, yeah. like Stephanie said, make an appointment with them. You get to talk to them. And, you know, we talked, uh, I talked about this at the end, you can bring all these advocacy groups with you and just show up. Right. And like, it's not a protest, but saying, mm -hmm. Hey, we have this coalition mm -hmm. about mental health issues regarding the criminal justice system. And we'd like to talk to congressman slash women so and so or representative so and so about these issues, right? And then when they see this whole group come in, they take it really seriously all the time. At least I've seen. Um, yeah, that, yeah. I was gonna say the consistency too, like the yes. consistency of just continuously uh, showing up and and making sure right. you're heard. They definitely take note on that. Yes. And and even uh, another uh, uh, another thing you could do. Um, letter campaigns. Mm -hmm. I know um, Action Network, for example, anyone can write a letter campaign. And, and 
it can be one type of message and um, anyone can send that message with their name saying signing off an agreement. Uh, and you know, when our local politicians see so many of those, yeah. they again know it's something they need to pay attention to. Uh, mm -hmm. They see there is a set a sense of urgency around the issue. And to our guest's point about the, the power numbers that your local and state uh, like NAMI organizations, they have cap, capital days or whatever they call them, but I know that Wisconsin is coming up soon. And they make a point of having a bus and all going in together so that they see that there's that group. And it's not just like, I'm sorry, I, you know, would you do me a favor and fund mental mm -hmm. health? You know, that it, it's, right. a, it's a definite like, hey, to use your word, Alexandria, you know, that there's an urgency to this. And the more, the more, uh, I, I don't want to say like totem pole, but it is to a certain extent, like talking to your local congressman slash woman versus talking to your mayor, the more local you get, the more accessible that individual person Absolutely. is that you can you can easily schedule an appointment right um you know right. so that's something to keep in mind is like on the local level is where the most change happens like right. people have this misconception oh gotta talk to my congressman slash woman you know that, that, that's that's where it all is you know on cnn and fox right that's where we right. see the glamour of this dc when necessarily right the programs that you know, could really make a difference in my office. I know in Alexandria's office, actually on the state and local level, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll echo that because I'm thinking of changes I've seen um, through advocacy. For example, accountability for Dearborn as folks on the city of Dearborn, uh, uh, you know, specifically local politics and seeing the changes there were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was more access, it is more easier to, and it impacts you more, right? Like it, sure. you're, you're right in that city. And, and seeing that, you know, for example, they had a border crimes, um, uh, uh, a, border, a border crimes team um, that focused on uh, the border between Detroit and Dearborn. And, and through research, we found that the largest amount of people who were ticketed and, and put in jail were uh, because of that team and they were largely um, black community members coming from Detroit. Uh, and that uh, team um, was removed um, completely. Mm. And, and it's no longer existing. And, you know, it was a couple of community members, myself <laughs> uh, at the time, uh, doing research and calling these things out saying, hey, do you have you noticed this? Have you seen this? This isn't right. And, and I'm happy to say that, you know, as of, uh, it's 2023. <laughs> uh, as of last year, that is something that was completely abolished. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Nick, are that's you great. adding all this to the part two webinar? I was going to say right. we need outtakes. That's what's going yeah, through my head got, right now. <laughs> Honestly, like outtake, you're still you, recording. We, yeah, we need an outtake. Kind of yeah, I'm I'm going through my head on how to cut this up because yeah. this is all yeah. amazing content too. Yeah, I do wonder content. about participatory budgeting. Sorry. Can you go sit in on those kind of meetings or are those meetings closed? Because to advocate for such a thing, if it doesn't exist, how do you get it started? Do you go sit in meetings and make your presence known and then talk to people there? Or I'm just the, the participatory budgeting makes perfect sense to me, but how do you get it started? People are like, I've always done it this way. <laughs> I don't want to change. So um, I'm curious to know what that process would yeah. be figure that oh, out oh well i was gonna say okay so if it's like uh, i know in the city of chicago the aldermen right like th those types of city council meetings are always open, uh, open. For the most part. yeah i think it depends on the legislative body right like let's say in the capital in um lansing for michigan or for springfield in illinois right uh, by all means you could always like watch on tv or whatever but like where the representatives are that's going to be closed off to the representatives you can't just like walk in when the bill is being passed but during the committee sessions where all the action happens right that's where the advocacy groups can really kick in right and you get people to come in and testify and you push and you lobby these representatives to come in and tell them why it's such an important issue and the the the, the true magic happens is once you get the actual representatives to be an advocate for your cause, because boom, you have an inside person now, right? And they're on the committee, right? And they're advocating, right, right. oh, fellow colleagues, we should get on board for X, Y, Z reason. So the hope is, is that you, you know, flip these individuals or you uh, convince the individuals, I mean, flip sounds kind of bad, but like you convince these individuals 
to buy in and believe in your cause. I say also too, like um, certain times of the year when it's budget season, uh, planning around those things as well. Um, and I know uh, it, may, it, it could vary depending on the city, but so I forget beginning of the year, for example, um, uh, for where I am, uh, planning around that and attending those uh, city, uh, what is it, the, the working meetings that, that aren't so much um, council meetings where they have kind of that set agenda and, and, mm -hmm. and that uh, typical flow, but it, it's, it's more for working things out, um, i.e. the budget or, or other things, but planning around that um, um, each year or each time of the year uh, also will help. Okay, and so we just had our state of the state and our governor has declared 2023 to be the year of mental health. Oh, it's wow. going to be the state's focus this wow. year. For um, that's just been announced. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to figure out how the foundation can get in on the ground level of advocacy now that the governor has declared it uh, the year of mental health for the state. Yeah, this is such a great opportunity for the foundation. It is. It's a great opportunity. Announcing That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, there's grants now, right, for this year that are going to be out there, right, and not just even the money aspect, but like, you know, events that the foundation can jump in. I know, Terry, you're involved with a bunch of mental health organizations. Like, this yeah. is such an amazing opportunity of a year for the state of Wisconsin and these types of organizations. Nice. I'll send you the invitation, Stephanie. Um, it's coming up, and I actually have a hotel room in Madison, our capital. Um, and we, you know, you're, you're welcome to join me. I would love to. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Nick, you got what you need? I uh, have more than what I need. <laughs> thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you both so much. Thank you both. Little, thank it's, you. Uh, it's the end of a long day for all of us so that you're still awake and thinking is amazing. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is yeah, a fruitful cool conversation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, for me, I mean, this was a you know very engaging and thoughtful, and it was a blast. Honestly, great people. I, I thought it was great. Really lively, which was great.